I talked about a guy named Anthony Tot. I believe that's how you say his name. And he's done some pretty bad stuff. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, and if I mispronounce his name and call him Toad, just expect it. I will at some point. But this video is him on the stand testifying. The first one we're going to see is him under direct and then under cross. What we did not choose to do is the police interrogation and confession of this guy. He's changed stories three times. So we know he's a liar. We just don't know when he's lying until we watch this video and we'll show you what we see. The story is his wife, his 13-year-old, his 11-year-old, and his four-year-old daughter were all murdered. And he was charged with their murders and sentenced to life in prison without parole and murdered his dog and was suffocated his dog and was given an extra year in addition to his life sentence for that. So he's a convicted murderer. Whether you want to believe what he says here or not, it's another story. And stayed in the house with all his family's dead bodies piled up in the master bedroom for several weeks after the murders. What was the occurrence that made that day memorable? I came home and my kids were dead. It was the most horrible day of my life. And what I mean more horrible is my wife died in front of me also. Mr. Coat, had there been a, a blueberry pie that was cooked in the house? According to what she told me, Objection here, sir. And a, Hold on just a sec, Mr. Tell response. Describe what you know or saw and not what you heard from another person, if you can. Thank you, sir. When I came home that morning, I knew my family the night before was having dessert, and I declined it because you saw my health. I was jogging and losing weight. I came home that morning, and there was a melted... Purple, looked like a pudding pie. I, I can't really tell you exactly what it was. She told me what it was later, but it was in a graham cracker crust. And the, the kitchen, it was my job to clean the kitchen. But when I came home, that purple, bluish, grapeish, melted, I guess you want to say, a pie dish was sitting there on the counter with some residue on the kids um, that the kids places on their on their plates. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about emotions, because that's what hits me about this first one. Clearly, uh, right at the start of this piece, he's looking to inform his his audience, my guess is a jury to one side of him, uh, that some emotions are going on. And, you know, you be the judge of whether you think they're uh, real or false or, or whatever. But let me tell you a little bit about emotions. For the whole of kind of Western history, the element of water has been associated with emotions and the, and the humours, the, uh, the things that create our mind back in medieval days. These four humours were liquids and they would kind of wash around in you. And so you get this general idea from the start of psychology, early psychology, that emotions kind of flow and they collide and they mix with each other. Well, here's what happens in this situation. You get this kind of fluid at the start, but then it turns to ice really quickly. Look how it quickly becomes a very, very solid state. And that's why I believe if you look at this and you go, there's something kind of up with this. It's not just the collision of ideas at the start or, the, or that it doesn't quite flow as you'd quite like. It's that it suddenly stops around second 50. Around second 50, it goes to ice. And so it's no surprise that often for people who we feel are emotionless or hollow or even we might call them psychopathic or, or sociopathic, we'll often use the metaphor of ice for them because it's that state of water not being fluid anymore and being set and locked and it can't collide. There. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you and I must point out exactly where the change occurs. 
this is a really interesting one because before he starts to talk, before he's asked the question, he engages a grief muscle, which makes me think show, 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 show and tell. And he ambers. I'll just use that as a verb. He turns to the audience or to the jury and boom, full blown everything he's got there. But it's not real. It's not believable. It does look like remorse. There's sorrow in his brows. His chin is up. His chin boss is involved. He's trying to contain his emotion with his lips. That all looks real. There's a lot of reasons to have remorse. Killing your family might be a reason to have remorse, not that your family died, but that grief muscle showing up before he even asked the question is an interesting one. It makes me think, okay, here I'm prepared and I'm ready to go. And when he starts talking about, I came home and my children were dead, there's no anger. Look, my wife is there, my children are dead. What sane person walks in the door, your wife's there, your children are dead, she tells you kill them, and there's no anger. There's all this other emotion, but there's no anger. That's odd and misplaced. I'll give him the benefit of a doubt. Go further into this before we figure it out. Um, but I've watched all these videos and I have an opinion. You'll find out later. But this stuff changes so quickly. He has rapid grief muscle there, and then it just disappears when he says, at my wife died also. And he gets a little tear, but he's, uh, he's doing something I call milking your eyes, squeezing the hell out of his eyes. So you get a little bit of fluid to come out of your eyes. And he tongue juts at according to what she told me. Now, go watch his interrogation if you have the stomach for it. It's horrible. You'll learn that this was Benadryl baked into a pie and some kind of a frozen treat for the kids so they could do something to the kids more easily. He knew what it was. His eyes dropped down to his left as he navigates the message. That doesn't always mean he's lying, but in this case it does, and all that emotion just disappears from his face. When the rescuer asks the question, he goes into internal voice and says, thank you, sir, as if he's talking to a guy about ice cream. And then he goes to high ground. I was jogging because I was losing weight. And then he goes back to a normal baseline with no emotion. That's a lot going on and a lot of fading. Mark, to your point, we call it freezing. It just disappeared. This is the most emotional thing that most people would ever go through in their lives. And for him, just gone like that. Chase, what do you got? Totally agree with you. Uh, throughout this whole thing, there's no emotional accessing. And that's when someone moves their eyes down into their right, to their right. So if you're sitting in a Tesla and you look at that big screen, that's emotional accessing there. <laughs> Would be for me. There's an <laughs> eye flutter as as well there. And that it's typically a response to some kind of mental stress or, or what we call cognitive load. They're processing uh, data. Uh, grief could be from regret, not the recall. So we're seeing a little bit of grief there. And let me just make a quick distinction. When we're talking about shame, shame is an external emotion that we show publicly. Guilt is an internal feeling that we feel inside. So shame is external, guilt is internal. There's no mention of anybody's name here. And this is a big deal that we see commonly in guilty people. Again, there's a vanishing perpetrator. Kids were dead. Not my wife had killed them. My kids were dead. I came home and my kids were dead. That's a big deal. That's vanishing perpetrator. And when he says blueberry pie, he gets to talk about blueberry crap, whatever he's talking about. There's instant excitement. There's micro eye widening. You can see his eyes get bigger. There's an instant drop of sadness on the face. All that sadness, he's like, oh, this is the time where I get to talk about the pie. And I counted, he spent 970% more time talking about the details of this blueberry pie than the deaths of his wife and children. That's a big deal. And uh, seven and a half uh, milligrams per kilogram is an overdose limit of Benadryl. I weigh 75 uh, kilograms, give or take. So that would be, give or take, 750 or something like that. But listen again. You'll hear a lot of detail, but the detail added is made to inject ambiguity. So anytime you hear a spike of detail and it's not about the relevant event and the details actually add ambiguity to the story, that should be the most massive red flag of all. Scott? All right. I, I, all you guys are spot on. I, we're seeing a, an attempt at sadness. This isn't sadness because when she asked him the question, just like Amber heard, he looks over at the, the jury and he starts delivering. We're not, other than that little watery thing, Greg, you're going to call it a tear. <laughs> I'm not going to give him that. There's no redness in the sclera. There's no residual redness anywhere on him. 
the, 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 we see the glabella contracting and that grief muscle is not even a real grief muscle. It's just, he's trying his best and he tries to keep that engaged because we see it keep disappearing. Then it comes back down because when that's happening, you can't help it. This part goes down like it comes inward and upward and this part comes down. And that's what makes that upside down horseshoe looking thing. And you wouldn't say, I came home and my kids were dead. You wouldn't say I came home. You'd said I found my kids dead. And she asked him what happened that day. I found my kids dead. He would have said I found my whole family dead or my family. But he zeroes in on the kids first. I just thought that was odd. On the, the question about the blueberry pie, Greg, you're spot on with that. Two seconds after he gets into that, all that sadness is gone. That's it's just boom. It's gone. Nothing. Nothing. No residual anything in that emotion anywhere. And then. Um, Everything he talks about, he has this, these extremely detailed memories, like you were talking about, Chase, about the pie and the this and the door. As we go through these, listen to all the details this guy throws out about everything. But when you start act, talking about what actually happened, watch how far away he gets from that. But everything is this really odd detail, and that's because he's thought his story out. He's had a lot of time to sit in there while he's thinking, how am I going to, I already told him I did, how am I going to switch this around and make it look like that I didn't do it. How am I going to get out of this? And he's thought and thought, and he's walked his way through that. Okay, here's what I'm going to say then. And that's why he comes up with all, it has to stop him and say, you want the whole story, which you're going to see in a few minutes. It's just, it's it's ridiculous. It, we're, we're, he's he's trying so hard to look like one thing, when he's actually something else. So that's why he's in defense mode. And it sounds like if these were swords, when they were talking, it would just sound like a fencing tournament in there. Because every time the, the attorney asks something, he jets, he just squirts back really quickly with a, with a quick, short, tight answer. What was the occurrence that made that day memorable? I came home and my kids were dead. It was the most horrible day of my life. And what I mean more horrible is my wife Died in front of me also. Mr. Had there been a, a blueberry pie that was cooked in the house? According to what she told me. Objection here, sir. And a, Hold on just a sec, Mr. Tell response. Describe what you know or saw and not what you heard from another person, if you can. Thank you, sir. When I came home that morning, I knew my family the night before was having dessert, and I declined it because you saw my health. I was jogging and losing weight. I came home that morning, and there was a melted purple, looked like a pudding pie. I, I can't really tell you exactly what it was. She told me what it was later, but it was in a graham cracker crust. And the, the kitchen, it was my job to clean the kitchen. But when I came home, that purple, bluish, grapeish, melted pie, I guess you want to say, the pie dish was sitting there on the counter with some residue on the kids um, at the kids' places on their on their plates. You get back, and now it's daylight. The sun is up. Yes. And which door of the house you go into? Back door. So you go in the back door, and what do you do? Go to pee. Okay. After I walked through the kitchen and saw the remnants of everything. Okay. So you see everything still on the table. You walk. You pass the bathroom to go upstairs, right? No, I went to the bathroom downstairs. Okay. I thought earlier you testified that you went upstairs to After go to the I bathroom. After I went to the bathroom. What I testified was I went to the bathroom, then went upstairs to meet my wife. Okay. So at what point did she come to the top of the stairs then? When I came out of the bathroom downstairs, she must have heard motion. She was at the top of the stairs. Okay. So um, were the doors to the library open or closed? Don't know. Didn't see them. Is the library not close to the stairs? The library is past the stairs, that's correct. But when you have to pee, you have to pee. 
Well, you're standing at the bottom of the stairs looking up at Megan at the stairs. You can't see the doors to the library? Ma'am, can you see that gentleman back there? Mike, you don't ask me questions, I ask you questions. Can you see the door to the library when you're standing at the stairs looking up at Megan? No. Okay. And you're engaging with Megan, and what is Megan's demeanor? Not what she says, what is she doing, and how is she appear to you? She's standing at the top of the stairs. She has tears in her eyes and said, you're alive. Okay. And what is she wearing? She's wearing my gray Hydra Works shirt, which is something she usually slept in. And she's wearing some kind of pants of some sort. She had clothes on. And did she have any injuries at that point? Ma'am, I, she was standing there. She was fine. I don't know. I hugged her, kissed her, told her, I'm sorry I'm late. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to be long on this one, I warn you, because this is a good example of smartassery meets bad questioning. And she does a poor job of questioning here. I'm going to point out the mechanics of questioning where she fails, because she's effectively showing him Edward Lee's story tale. He came in with a plan. You can see it clearly. He doesn't access anything. He's telling you what he remembers. It's rote memory. He's just rolling it off. Watch the lack of eye contact with the jury now. He's on with her. He knows she's a threat. He's not trying to convince. He's locked on the threat. He's doing what Scott and I call in, in the True Crime Workshop, the romancer. I mean, eyes locked, all constant attention, very little blink rate. He starts that iterative storytelling. And he does lip compressions at almost every step. Now, when we mean iterative storytelling, I'm going to give you a little piece of information to get my next piece out so that I get out what I want you to hear. And when we say lip compression, often that's withheld information or emotion. He goes through that and he starts to bite the inside of his mouth. That's an adapter. It's a way to, way to release nervous energy because he can see what's coming. She allows him to deny. And that could be part about the door being closed or the door being near the, um, the bathroom. That could be an elicitation technique. You can feign ignorance and say, isn't the door near this? And let that add you. That's what it is. Bad questioning. It's a bad style. When he's living, his blood rate is yesterday. It's zero. There's none. His pursed lips indicate he's got some apprehension and he's hanging on to her words and ready for retort. He's just waiting. Here's where she really makes a mess of the questions. And if you're listening, I'll send you a class for free because these are horrible questions. A leading question. When you ask, was this, was the door here? Okay, that's a leading question. Yes or no is all they can answer. Compound, was it open or closed? That means you're asking a question, then say yes or no to, and it should be that way. Negative, was the library not close to the stairs? All of that creates confusion and allows this guy room to do a lot of BS. And if you ask the questions more concisely without giving him that wiggle room, you get information. So all that ambiguity allows him to get away with some things and all those lip compressions and that he starts to feel like kind of he's got the upper hand. You see him moving his body around. He's feeling a little stress. The other one that there's a source lead and a source lead is when somebody says something you should follow up on and jump on it immediately. She misses is his wife said you are alive. Hmm. Why would she be asking you that would be one of the things he's not accessing and he has concern in his brow as he replies for the only only time. And he does do, I'll bring it up, Chase, because I got it in my notes. He's got one single shoulder hopping all over the place. I know that's a lot, usually, but this is a mess. And he's getting away with some iterative storytelling. We'll see that come apart later. Scott, what do you got? All right. He first, when he answers questions, then he backtracks and starts adding all these qualifiers to it. to make Because he's forgotten to say that. He hasn't practiced this story out loud. He's always practicing in his head when he's in his cell. So as he tells the story, he, he says the whatever the part is they ask, gives him the answer, and he goes back and starts adding things to it. You're right, his, his adapter is that lip grip and that mouth movement, that chewing on his mouth and all that. When she asks him about the library, and this is going, going everything we teach in, about deception, we're seeing in this. Everything from stress mouth to uh, quick little shoulder shrugs to adapters. This is this is great because everything we talk about, you're going to see it here. Yeah, but it's so blatant, it's it's hard to even take seriously that it almost looks like it's been set up because there are so many of them. His cadence is is moving right along at a fairly good clip. His um, his eye contact is hard. 
You know, he's trying to, 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 to make sure he's got all the information so he has, his, has see how it fits within his story so he can deliver that really well. And at the very end, we see what I call mercy hands. It's when that hand goes up and it's like, oh, please have mercy on me. Please believe what I'm saying. You can't see it hardly. But when you see that, that's what I call it. It's not like this when somebody's doing this. It's that complete that and those palms come up and they push their hands out like that. That's what I refer to as mercy hands. All right, uh, Chase, what do you got? Yep. I agree with you guys. I saw a lot of the same stuff. I'll uh, just go through the things that y'all didn't cover yet. Uh, this, I just want you to look at this choppy, quick vocal shift here when he's addressing the opposing counsel. Uh, his attorney might not be the best in the world at preparation. Uh, there should have been a, like the attorney says, okay, this guy freaks out easily. I'm going to set up a hand signal. If I reach my arm up and I start scratching my head to get your attention, you need to calm down and then you need to stay calm. There's a chin boss movement uh, at this question. And question to you, is this shame or guilt a response to seeing the remnants of everything or a response to the guilt of either uh, maybe lying about it? And I think this is almost just embarrassing to watch for me. His chest is heaving, uh, fighter flies kicking in, of course. And when she's saying it's the library not close to the stairs, uses maybe a 10-ish o'clock accessing. So his eyes are moving to our 10 o'clock as we're, we're looking at his face. Uh, so, I'd, of course, he knows where this is. He's processing the data. So I, as an interrogator, you as a panelist, We'll be knowing like that's truthful information. I'm going to file this away in my brain that that 10 o'clock movement is very important to, for when I'm about to ask other questions here in the next few minutes. And they're going to be important. Uh, like he goes like, see that man over there? He's like challenging her. She does nothing about it. Uh, his chin kind of goes up in this little defiance, like, like an 11 year old. And I think it's really great that when she does actually kind of smack down a little bit, like, you don't ask me questions. There's a postural retreat. There's an eyebrow flash for innocence there and a dominant shoulder retreat of some kind of concealed anger. Uh, so a lot of people, we have types of people in the world. Some people practice self-control. This guy has lived his whole life practicing self-restraint, and you can see it. So he has no control. He has to use like an emergency break for everything because he, these everything in his life gets out of hand. My best psychology professor I ever had in my life said, you're only ever going to see two types of patients, those who need loosening and those who need tightening. This guy needs a little loosening. And happiness brings you loosen, loosening, not pleasure. And there is a difference. Uh, there's a whole lot else to have here. Um, the final thing, I'll skip over everything else. When she's asking, was she injured? Was there any injuries? What a moron. And this is my opinion. I'll just say that right now. You'll be able to dissect one this one easily. I think uh, my dog could dissect this. It's uh, we're seeing a child trapped inside of it, what should be a man's body. That's all I got. Uh, okay. So let's tap into this idea of emotions a little bit and work out which emotions might be real in him, which are not potentially. Well, actually, it's more going to be which ones are true for him. So remember, the premise is, is that emotions are like water because they flow and they merge and they're either like water. Water is either very, very direct yeah, or totally indirect. It either goes where you think it's going to go or goes where you didn't think it was going to go, but goes there directly. Or it kind of just meanders around and you go, where the hell's that water going? How did it get from there to there? Well, what I want you to notice at the start is that his gestures are very indirect at the start. A lot of breaks in the line of energy there as he kind of points within what I'd call first circle, you know, close into his body. But then as he says, hey, see that, that gentleman over there suddenly becomes very, very direct. Well, I'd suggest because he's transitioning now to anger. That's we got that look out the juice and the 
through line of energy, that's very, very real, okay? He really wants to take control of that moment and goes very, very direct. So from indirect, again, very true, that he doesn't quite know where he is at the moment and he's trying to find his stability and then very, very direct to c- take control. She says, I ask the questions. And just as uh, Chase was saying there, we then get some very indirect movement. We get the head wobble, he moves to the side and cloud is a whole different type of water. Look, nothing made up there. All of that, very, very true in terms of his own emotional state. He's telling all kinds of other stories, but the emotional state he's in there of anger, trying to take control, uh, then realizing he does have control and he's going to have to sit back and, and, and go with the flow of what's going on. Again, very, very true. You get back, and now it's daylight. The sun is up, yes. And which door of the house you go into? Back door. So you go in the back door, and what do you do? Go to pee. Okay. After I walk through the kitchen and saw the remnants of everything. Okay. So you see everything still on the table. You walk. You pass the bathroom to go upstairs, right? No, I went to the bathroom downstairs. Okay. I thought earlier you testified that you went upstairs to After go to the I bathroom. went to the bathroom. What I testified was I went to the bathroom, then went upstairs to meet my wife. Okay. So at what point did she come to the top of the stairs then? When I came out of the bathroom downstairs, she must have heard motion. She was at the top of the stairs. Okay. So um, were the doors to the library open or closed? Don't know. Didn't see them. Is the library not close to the stairs? The library is past the stairs, that's correct. But when you have to pee, you have to pee. Well, you're standing at the bottom of the stairs looking up at Megan at the stairs. You can't see the doors to the library? Ma'am, can you see that gentleman back there? Mike, you don't ask me questions, I ask you questions. Can you see the door to the library when you're standing at the stairs looking up at Megan? No. Okay. And... You're engaging with Megan, and what is Megan's demeanor? Not what she says, what is she doing, and how is she appear to you? She's standing at the top of the stairs. She has tears in her eyes and said, you're alive. Okay, and what is she wearing? She's wearing my gray HydroWorks shirt, which is something she usually slept in, and she's wearing some kind of pants of some sort. She had clothes on. And did she have any injuries at that point? Man, I, she was standing there. She was fine. I don't know. I hugged her, kissed her, told her, I'm sorry I'm late. And is Alec and Tyler's door open? That I don't recall, ma'am. I'm sorry. Why did you go to Zoe's room? Because she said she, she said the kids were dead. And Zoe was my little angel. That's the first one I went to. So when you get into Zoe's room, what do you see? There's a pillow on her head. There's a hand. And there's covers on top of her. She's laying on her mattress on the floor. The mattress is on the floor. She's laying on her mattress. What do you do? I went over to her. I uncovered her, her mouth, uh, uncovered her face with a pillow. She had told me that she had stabbed the kids. So, of course, I look for blood. I look for anything. I look for any sign of life. It was nothing. I turned back to her and I said, I thought you stabbed her. She says, I thought I did. I didn't know. It bounced off of her. Okay. So, after you discover Zoe, what do you do? I went to the bathroom and picked up a washcloth. Her mouth was open. Her eyes were open. She looked uncomfortable. It's my normal demeanor to help put my kids in rest. Don't ask me why I did it. I was trying to close her eyes. Okay, so where's Megan when you're doing this? Somewhere behind me. She was following me, talking to me. At one point she was standing in the doorway, talking to me from the doorway to me because I was asking her. I I said, I thought you stabbed the kids. Okay, so did you You said you had charged your phone the night before. Did you have your phone? I said I plugged it in 
and attempted to charge. Little did I know that the charger was not a direct charger. It had to have the engine on. The, the battery never charged. And I also found out that phone wasn't an active phone. That was an active, that was a phone that we used for things. So no, it was not charged and it was not a technical phone. Okay. Did, were there other phones in the house? There were other possessions of phones in the house, but Megan hid them and would not tell me where she hid them. So it's your testimony that you could not have called anybody. That's correct. I didn't have a phone. And it's All right, Chase, what do you got? All right, here we are. Remember when I asked you to pay attention to that 10 o'clock eye movement to recall the details of the house? Well, right here, we see something very different. What we see is 2 o'clock. So not only are we in a different position, we're in a different hemisphere. A different part of the brain is being accessed here, which is a gigantic red flag, like a Texas-sized red flag. What happened to the emotions about the incident? We're not seeing those. And we're also seeing something very unusual here. We're seeing a person who's uncomfortable getting angry. And when you see this, if the person is actually angry, and you don't see their actual response to anger, but you see self-restraint and you see other little behaviors that are childlike, which is exactly what we're seeing here. If you ever meet somebody like this, you're either facing somebody with low self-control or somebody who's going to push you in front of a bus uh, to save themselves because they doubt themselves that much. And people with a high self-worth and high self-control are able to exhibit being angry without any risk of violence. And that's the difference there. He's clinically going through this description of finding her like a like a surgeon would describe this to one of his colleagues about cutting open somebody's heart. And this is horrifying. And he's not even feeling anything. And then there's dissociative language when he's talking about his own children. A hand. He uses the word a hand was there and never uses their names. There's a pillow on her head. There's a hand, and there's covers on top of her. She's laying on her mattress on the floor. Look, the mattress is on the floor. She's laying on her mattress. And you already know this is complete and total BS, but we're here to point out why your brain sees that so clearly. So he's checking the child to see if she's alive, and his only confusion here is about not seeing stab wounds. It was nothing. I turned back to her. And I said, I thought you stabbed her. That's it. No emotion, nothing else. Just, hey, I thought you stabbed him. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard. And using a washcloth to close her eyes, I think this is actually truthful in some regard. I think this was a time where he actually just covered their faces. And a lot of times when murderers are uh, really close to victims, the shame of seeing their face and especially their eyes, because eyelids don't close like they do in movies. Uh, this is usually going to drive murderers to cover up faces. I've been on a lot of deployments and I have gotten desensitized to some seriously horrific stuff. Kids in cases like this are not something you can get used to. And this is a horrific case, but this guy is almost so stupid. It's hilarious. So there's at least that that we can enjoy uh, while we're here. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so he wants you to believe that what he's saying has some emotion to it and is true. But how can we tell whether it's true or false? True or false? True or false? Well, is he acting like water at the moment? Is there some flow to it? Is it, is it, um, is it indirect in its flow or is it very direct in its flow? Or is he more like ice? Well, you're probably going to say he's more like ice. But you might go... Well, he's quite direct, you know, but he's never fully getting there. I want you to notice how all the sentences break up. I went over to her. I uncovered her, her mouth, uh, uncovered her face with a pillow. She had told me that she had stabbed the kids. So though he does get to the end, it shifts along like a block of ice, it doesn't go directly and it doesn't flow. So look, I want you to think about it in this way. Is it legato, if that word means anything to you, which kind of means kind of Italian for kind of musical term for flowing, or is it staccato, which is another 
Italian musical term for being kind of jagged. Here's what we know about poker, by the way. By the way, don't go and play poker unless you really understand mathematics and probability. Number one thing, you've got to understand mathematics and probability. Above and beyond that, if you're looking for the tells of people, there is one tell that has been proven to show that somebody is confident or unconfident about the hand that they may have in their hand. And that is, do they push in their chips? Do they push in their bet staccato or legato? Does it flow in like water or does it kind of jutter? In. So you've got to look really carefully, but there are some really good, some really good scientific papers that suggest that is the thing, the best. Thing. There are lots of things you can look out for, but that's going to be your best bet above and beyond understanding math and probability. So is he staccato or is he legato? Because if he's staccato, we would probably suggest he's not telling the truth and he's not confident about this. And that's why you get sentences that don't quite follow through to the end. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so Chase, I'm with you. He does a variation from his last eye accessing. He's still in the visual area of the brain, but either last time he was lying or this time he's lying. We can't really tell absolutely 100% because we don't know what's going on in the house. However, when he says, is the door opening? It looks like an actual eye access for memory. And then he disclaims. And then he says, by saying, I don't recall, ma'am. He's overly polite. Is Alec and Tyler's door open? That I don't recall, ma'am. I'm sorry. That cluster of behaviors makes us think this is the lie side. The other side is actually retrieving information. So when you start to distance yourself, we, this is a great example of looking for clusters. We can't tell for sure, but what we know is he's gone to two different places in his head for the same kind of information. So good call. Why did you go to Zoe's room? Cadence shifts immediately. She said she dad dad that and just goes off and slows down. He eye blocks, he blows out air and he swivels. Now eye blocking and blowing out air could be exasperation, could be a very bad feeling, something that could be real feelings. But when we see that, we also then expect clusters of good behavior. Some arching of that grief muscle in the forehead, <clears throat> some concern in the brow, some drawing of the sides of the mouth. None of that's there. It just looks like clinical. Like he's, I have a note here. It's like he tells you he's driving a 2011 Traverse. That's with a cut in the right front seat. That's what it yeah. looks like. Oh yeah, my Traverse. I don't have any belief in him at all. We had a baseline for what was really emotional earlier. Either that was real or this is real. Which is it? Come on. You're really not very smart to do this. I think the guy is smart. He's a physical therapist. He had to go through school. He had to go through a whole lot of memorization, and he's doing that here. I think he's smart. He just is making some stupid moves. He thinks he's smarter than the whole system. It doesn't matter that she's not getting information because he comes across as a jerk. And remember, the jury gets to vote, and that's one of the things you have to be careful for. He also does some turtling, and he's got the best example of turtling I've ever seen because he's heavy, and his neck kind of shrinks down in his body. And then this this thick neck, you can watch his pulse in the thick neck. It's it's comical almost, so watching and paying attention to it. Then he stumbles over those words about comfort, and you can clearly see that those are not comforting words. He gives a great baseline for BS because we can't miss it. And then... He does lip withdrawal and I didn't have a phone. He has this thing all prepared like he thinks he knows where he's going and nothing works. And then he starts to stammer and the phone falls apart. If you really want to find it, go watch his interrogation. You'll hear where he's making up all this stuff. That's it. That's what I got. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Again, he's just running down the, down the path and just and – just, given his rehearsed answers. Mark, what you're talking about, about water and ice, I call that loping. The difference in that, when you're just, you talk, you just kind of lope along through the field on a horse and everything's fine. And it just flows right out. And when it doesn't, that's when you say something's not right here. And you usually hear those, those are examples of someone who is, is just re repeating a story they've said inside and not outside or out to the world that they haven't told to anybody. When he, and you're right, Greg, or who was it that said there was no emotion when he described as a little, little angel? Nothing, 
nothing there at all. If that was his little angel, we would go back to seeing those same expressions we saw earlier with, with his eyebrows, with his, his glabella at least pulled together. He would have thought, oh, I'm supposed to be sad here. I can try to look sad. We don't see anything in that part. His vocal tone is as strong as his cadence is a bit fast, but he sounds like during this, he's discussing plans on, on landscaping the yard. It sounds like he's talking to the yard guy. Here's what we're going to do. I want to try to do this. And we'll try. And then he tries to think what, and then goes on. Just, it's out of hand here. There's no loping going on whatsoever. Now, if he's thinking, if, if he's come to, to the revelation that his children are dead, and he's assuming that his wife did it, what do you think he's going to do? He's not going to stay. There's, he, he, there's no... He doesn't talk about feeling threatened or in danger or if, or if she hadn't told him. You see two dead kids in there, you're like, oh, my Lord, you know, what's going to happen? Am I in danger? That would be your first thought. You wouldn't be standing around looking, doing stuff. You'd be you'd have your back to wherever that had happened and wait for something else to come at you at that point. And then when he says uh, after he didn't find the phone, he, he, he uh, was hollering out the window to see if anybody was there to help. He should have said, I was hollering at the, my neighbor, and he might have even said their name for help, you know, but he didn't say that. It's just it's just odd. This whole thing just turned into odd. That's what a normal person would do if you once you have this horrifying revelation that your wife had murdered everyone but you, you know, going back to the part where he should be afraid for himself, but he never even says that because it doesn't enter into his brain because, or his mind because he, he was never afraid of being killed since he was the one doing the killing. And is Alec and Tyler's door open? That I don't recall, ma'am. I'm sorry. Why did you go to Zoe's room? Because she said she... She said the kids were dead. And Zoe was my little angel. That's the first one I went to. So when you get into Zoe's room, what do you see? There's a pillow on her head. There's a hand. And there's covers on top of her. She's laying on her mattress on the floor. The mattress is on the floor. She's laying on her mattress. What do you do? I went over to her. I uncovered her, her mouth, uh, uncovered her face with a pillow. She had told me that she had stabbed the kids. So, of course, I looked for blood. I looked for anything. I looked for any sign of life. There was nothing. I turned back to her. And I said, I thought you stabbed her. She says, I thought I did. I didn't know. It bounced off of her. Okay. So, after you discover Zoe, what do you do? I went to the bathroom and picked up a washcloth. Her mouth was open. Her eyes were open. She looked uncomfortable. It's my normal demeanor to help put my kids in rest. Don't ask me why I did it. I was trying to close her eyes. Okay. So... Where's Megan when you're doing this? Somewhere behind me. She was following me, talking to me. At one point, she was standing in the doorway, talking to me from the doorway to me, because I was asking her. I I said, I thought you stabbed the kids. Okay. So, did you, you said you had charged your phone the night before. Did you have your phone? I said I plugged in and attempted to charge. Little did I know that the charger was not a direct charger. It had to have the engine on. The, the battery never charged. And I also found out that phone wasn't an active phone. That was an active, that was a phone that we used for things. So no, it was not charged and it was not a techno phone. Okay. Did, were there other phones in the house? There were other possessions of phones in the house, but Megan hid them and would not tell me where she hid them. So it's your testimony that you could not have called anybody. That's correct. I didn't have a phone. And it's. And what'd you find in Tyler's room? Or in Alec's room? In Alec and Tyler's room. Yeah. Alec was on his back, pillow over his head, covers over him, and there was blood. How much blood? Enough that I noticed. I can't really tell you because I pulled back the, the blankets. The shirt had some blood on it, and there was blood on the abdomen. Was there blood on the blankets? Didn't, didn't inspect it. My goal was to see if they were alive, and my goal was to see what the hell happened. Okay. My language. So, after you see Alec, do you go downstairs to Tyler? 
No, I actually do the same thing with the washcloth. His eyes were open and his mouth was gently slack, looked uncomfortable. Normal father thing is to relax their head and relax and I was just providing them comfort. Okay. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to be really short on this one. So I'm going to now let's bring in a whole new piece of literature from history, Dante's Inferno. This guy deserves a ninth plane of hell if he killed his kids this way, because that's what where betrayal belongs. And that's the ultimate in betrayal if you kill your children. Um, he has all the emotion of that whole routine of describing a car again. No engagement in the jury. I don't understand why he went earlier and now he's not going to. He does lip compression at what the hell happened. Well, he knows what the hell happened. It's clear to us. And then he says the normal father does a relaxing the head thing. And there's cadence shift in there that's awkward. Nothing natural about it. And then he starts to mill his jaw as he's talking. This Look, this guy came in here to iteratively storytell, and she's enabled that to now. We'll see this is going to fall apart here in a little bit. But right now... He, she's playing his game, he's playing her game, whatever you want. And he's got a lot of speech patterns that allow him to do this clipped, quick pieces and get back to the next piece. He's setting up the next sentence every time he says something. Mark, what do you have? Yeah, so I just want to point out that there's a transition for him into now justifying his behavior. Before, he's been going, well, he actually said, don't ask me why. Don't ask me why. I, I think it was around the uh, the towels on the head, the flannels on the head. I think it was around that. Don't ask me why. So it's basically saying, don't ask me to justify this. Because he probably felt a little more confident around that time. I think the pressure is building up for him. He's feeling less confident. And so he talks about the normal father thing. So he tries to socialize this into a normality so that, again, we won't dig into the story because, you know, this is what every normal father uh, would do. I don't think that's true at all, that every normal father would, would do that. Um, but just notice there that we can tell, I think, the pressure is coming on him because of this transition to now feeling like he has to justify. Scott, what do you got on this one? I think a normal father would be angry. I think he'd open up with anger. That's, I mean, that's his, his intro would be anger for a normal father. Seeing the child is, looks uncomfortable, what he should be worrying about is if that woman's going to stab him to death in a minute. That's what he should be focused on. But uh, well, like I said before, he's not. Then he talks about there being blood on the abdomen. That's not the abdomen. That's your child's stomach. You go in there and see your child dead and you're talking about it like you're, that's, he's not even giving the same respect you would give the frog in high school when you dissected the frog. He's not even talking about, about it like that. It's just, it's just it's, there's nothing there emotionally. He's not, he's, he doesn't, there's no empathy. There's no sympathy. There's no anger. There's nothing there. He's not even trying to fake any of it. No residual grief from any of that. If you're looking at your kid's stomach and, and your child is dead and you're seeing blood and you talk more about the situation of blood, you said there was blood. Really? Where, where, you know, you would say it's everywhere. Anytime you see a child's blood, it's too much blood. No matter how much it is, it's way too much. It doesn't even, doesn't say anything like that. Nothing. Nothing. So a normal father would not act this way and react this way at all. Not at all. Not even a little bit. Okay. We good? No. Oh, Chase. Can oh, I go? Chase, sorry. We're bad. Yeah, oh, sorry, man. <laughs> got too up. I got, got up into it too much. Go on. Oh, man. So, uh, you know, the first time I held a human brain, I was in college. And before anything happened, there was a person on the table and they told us her name and while we were holding this thing we're we're feel we're feeling the like the cerebellum area which is kind of like fish gills but we say this is her brain this is her temporal lobe not the temporal lobe we're saying her this is a person i didn't know i didn't have a, a personal relationship with and I'm still connected and I'm still using that language. And this person isn't doing it with their kids. It's a huge deal. And Greg, I think to your point about him not looking at the jury, I'll just say there's two things that can make your brain focus on something, whether you like it or not, something that's valuable and something that's threatening. That's it. I think in the beginning when his attorney was doing the questioning, the jury was a valuable thing. And threats are always more powerful than value for when it comes to competing for our focus. And then, then the prosecutor came in and the value kind of took over. 
But I do think he's genuinely recalling all of this, except that he's genuinely recalling bullet points that he made about all of this. So the recall is genuine, but the recall is not of the event. The recall is of a story. There's way more dissociative language. Like Scott, you said the abdomen. If you hear this ever in your life, when somebody's talking about their family or their kids, this should be the biggest red flag you have ever seen in your entire life. It And it means you need to be really ready or really careful before you form a relationship with someone that does this. And the washcloth provided the kid comfort. He did use the washcloth. I think he's legitimizing this behavior when he's saying the normal father thing. This is a very cheap, like nine-year-old level attempt to convince the jury that this is what fathers do. He used the washcloth to cover the faces for guilt. And what'd you find in Tyler's room? Or in Alec's room? In Alec and Tyler's room. Yeah, Alec was on his back. Pillow over his head, covers over him, and there was blood. How much blood? Enough that I noticed, I can't really tell you, because I pulled back the, the blankets, the shirt had some blood on it, and there was blood on the abdomen. Was there blood on the blankets? And didn't, didn't inspect it. My goal was to see if they were alive, and my goal was to see what the hell happened. Okay. My language. So after you see Alec, do you go downstairs to Tyler? No, I actually do the same thing with the washcloth. His eyes were open and his mouth was gently slack, looked uncomfortable. Normal father thing is to relax their head and relax. And I was just providing them comfort. Okay. Um, you can see that view from the bathroom. Can, is Megan within your view? No, she's standing by her end table. When I left her, she's standing by the end table on her side of the bed. Okay. And how long are you in the bathroom? Don't know. A few minutes. What happens when you come out of the bathroom? As I'm walking out of the bathroom, I hear a sound that is similar to a balloon. You know, like you rub a balloon, like mm -hmm. a... At which point, I poke my head out, you know, as we're coming out, and I see her laying on her back, stabbing herself. Where at? Is she in the bed? Is she? She's on laying floor? on her back, on her side of the bed, with her head on the pillow, laying on her back, on top of sheets, with the knife in her abdomen. What color was the knife? The knife was the only knife that was there. It was a green buck knife that I bought for the kids as a Christmas present as part of their fishing lures. Okay, so she has a green knife. That's correct. Um, is she right-handed or left-handed? Green-handled knife. Green-handled knife. Is she right-handed or left-handed? She's right-handed. And which hand was on the knife? Both hands were on the knife. Both hands were on the knife. Yes. And you said that the knife was in her abdomen. Yes. When you came out of the bathroom. Yes. What did you do? Um, I stood there in shock. And I said, what the hell are you doing? And at that point, she says, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. I'm sorry. She said, I'm doing what I did to the boys. Trying to get my inferior vena cava. Did you go for help? I went over to my wife and pleaded for her to tell me where the phones were. She asked me not to leave her. She did not leave the boys. So my question is, did you go for help? Yes or no? The answer is no. All right, well, I'll go first on this one. When he talks about coming out of the bathroom, he says, as we were coming out of the bathroom. He's the only guy there. So it makes me wonder what the hell's going on up on up in his head. What's this guy thinking about? Is he th is he thinking? I don't believe he's got multiple personalities or anything like that. But what's he thinking? Why is he saying as we came out of the bathroom? It's really really odd. That should and the attorney should have caught that and said, "What are you talking about?" But at the on the other hand, if she had caught it, what is she going to say? You said, "Oh, I'm sorry, I just meant me." Then you can't dig into psychology from that point. Um, but from that point of view, it's just kind of odd looking. You see him adapting by swaying back and forth from that chair. And his details are just finely tuned. He's got it all down, the green knife and corrects her on that. All those things are real stickler for these really these details that you don't need. Nobody needs to know any of that stuff. They're too intricate for real for real storytelling. That's what inhibits the uh, the loping there. That's why we're not hearing much of that. Um 
when it, when it, the the details are so intricate, for example, I thought this was a good one. When a director directs a movie and you, and you have an actor, and there's a situation, and the actor says, "Well, I've got to go over to so and so's house or go over there to you know miles away. I'll drive." The director doesn't have them show them saying goodbye, walking out the door, open the door, shutting the door behind them, walking out to the car, opening the car door, getting in, starting the car, putting on their seatbelt, adjusting the, and then driving off and then showing up, getting out of the whole scene. They just show them showing up over there or they show them leaving in the car or driving up. And that's it. That's it. These details mean nothing in this story. And it's just, and that's the, these are every time he gives one, it's flag, 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 because it's so odd and so out of, out of character for a real story. You know, um, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. This is a fantastic study for the beginner who's just getting into body language and trying to study deception, what to look for. That's all we're really seeing here are just cues of deception, pretty much. I mean, there's we're going to see him going to fight or flight here in a while, but this is this is just great for you to to look at and study. A lot of lot going on here. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this is going to start a two part story. Okay, Scott, come in. I see Scott there with a knife, stabbing himself and cutting his <laughs> inferior vena cava. Yeah. And I go, hey, Scott, where's your phone? Does anybody yeah. believe that? Does anybody believe that's what's happening? Does anyone really believe that a guy's going to walk up and the way he's going to try to stop his wife from slicing a major artery is to talk to her about her phone? That's not how life works. Aside from the fact she has a knife in her hand, he walks in, she's got it in her gut, just working around cutting an artery. Okay. We believe that for a minute. He's calm, but this is three years later. He's told this story, and he's doing that romance here. I'm not kidding you. Like, he's got his eyes locked because he's trying to see what she believes and what she doesn't. And that smart assery thing he does with little short clips to his questions and answers just keeps coming up. I don't know. I don't recall. This is the only place when he's talking about where were you and was the door open, that stuff, that his signaling is actually congruent because it's non-pertinent and he doesn't care whether she knows something or not. He edits and adjusts and he says she is standing, but that's very much a New England, Northeastern kind of thing. I had a good friend who would say, I'm working in the city for 35 years. So that's just a speech pattern thing. You don't read too much into that. There is some disgust when he talks about hearing something that sounded like a balloon. Makes me think that's probably what it sounded like when he did something. And that went through his head because you see his nose wrinkle in disgust and his face, Chase, as you always say, moved to the center. Really good way to put it. He goes into a lot of detail about the sheets and where she was lying and all that. That must have some pertinence in the way he's going to explain away blood patterns or something. Don't know. But then he gets meticulous with that green handle knife and you see him go back and attack that he should stay this way through the rest of the story and we're going to see that fall apart because we always say the pattern that you use should be the pattern you use for the rest of the time and i'll just i'll, I'll hop over that last one and then say this is just an iterative story and where's that emotion he was displaying for the jury when he's talking about his wife disemboweling herself in front of him this is just broken and you can't miss all of that when he says when he answers no watches lips and his chin withdraw. The, this guy's not believable. Scott, you're right. Everything that we teach, the most simple things are here, but they're in grand scale because he thinks he's outthought them. And every person, when they get on the stand, every person when they face an interrogator has their story made up. This guy's put a lot of time into it. He's had three years. And he's having to recant something he said before. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, the one thing he's got in common with Amber Heard, he thinks he's got them fooled. And that's he has confidence and stress at the same time, which makes these uh, behaviors more exaggerated. But there's more details here about trivial BS than any of the deaths of the kids or discovering uh, that they were dead in the first place. In very, very rare cases throughout my entire career, I will say something is definitively deceptive. This is one of them. If you hear a story where minute, stupid details are just vividly injected, and then the critical moments are just carelessly walked through, like someone reading a clothing uh, laundry label, that's deception. That is deception. You don't need many clusters, but here's the clusters we're seeing. We're seeing a detail spike, or let's call it a detail mountain. We're seeing a detail mountain with irrelevant BS, and we're seeing a detail valley when it comes to critical. Then we see another detail mountain when it comes to irrelevant BS. That's deception. And notice there's no emotion, no prying, no screaming, no care, no worry, no love, no anger, no sound that he's describing, no feeling. 
He's a physical therapist. His wife is a school teacher. Inferior vena cava is not something that she would say, in my opinion, I don't think. And I love how she's just stabbing herself and casually saying this and just very medically and clinically describing the exact name of the vein as she's stabbing herself in the stomach. It's just a casual conversation between medically educated people that the jury probably wouldn't understand. And I think that's exactly what's going on in his head. The jury's not going to get this. This is a really highly educated word. It's going to make the jury automatically believe me. I think that's what he's thinking. That's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let's look at some nonverbals that are going around those spikes of, of detail, because I agree with you on that. We get the first um, first time we've seen a moderator or regulator gesture out of him like this, which is a stop, a halt and suppress. So he comes in at a kind of a 45 degree angle, uh, green handled knife. So he wants, he wants the whole of this situation to just halt for a moment while he gives this piece of detail. We can't quite work out why this might be so important. Maybe it is pertinent to evidence, maybe not, I don't know. I think he just, it's a moment for him to go, I'll control this for a moment. Because he's hasn't got a lot of control, and my guess is his control is has some relative importance to him, especially as you've been saying, Chase, the suppression of something. So we get that nice, it's not fully suppressive, yeah, but it halts the proceedings and just pats down on that idea of the green handled knife. Then we get a beautiful example of the aloof eye block, which is when, uh, and, and Chase brought this to our attention many times ago around, what was it, the, the, the neighbor who's just got a solar panel yeah. on there. On well, there. it's good for the environment, you know. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so that I'm going to call the aloof eye block. It says, what it says is, I'm so much more bigger and important and more intelligent than you that I can't even look at you. I can't even look at you and you maybe shouldn't even be able to see me. And so, because I'm, you know, high on the pedestal and therefore, because I can't close your eyes, I'll close my own. So it feels like you can't see me and I can't, and I wouldn't ever deign to look at you. And we get that on the idea of when the stenographer, I think, says, can you repeat that? And he repeats inferior vena cava as if to say, come on, you idiot. Everybody knows the inferior vena cava. Everybody knows that. And that beautiful aloof eye block. Great example of that. Again, controlling the situation. Great moment where he's controlling some of the elements, the instruments, of the court, probably feeling pretty good for him. Um, you can see that view from the bathroom. Can, is Megan within your view? No, she's standing by her end table. When I left her, she's standing by the end table on her side of the bed. Okay. And how long are you in the bathroom? Don't know. A few minutes. What happens when you come out of the bathroom? As I'm walking out of the bathroom, I hear a sound that is similar to a balloon. You know, like you rub a balloon, like mm -hmm. a... At which point, I poke my head out you know, as we're coming out, and I see her laying on her back, stabbing herself. Okay. Where at? Is she in the bed? Is she She's on laying floor? on her back, on her side of the bed, with her head on the pillow, laying on her back, on top of sheets, with a knife in her abdomen. What color was the knife? The knife was the only knife that was there. It was a green buck knife that I bought for the kids as a Christmas present as part of their fishing lures. Okay, so she has a green knife. That's correct. Um, is she right-handed or left-handed? Green-handled knife. Green-handled knife. Is she right-handed or left-handed? She's right-handed. And which hand was on the knife? Both hands were on the knife. Both hands were on the knife. Yes. And you said that the knife was in her abdomen? Yes. When you came out of the bathroom? What'd you do? Um, I stood there in shock. And I said, what the hell are you doing? And at that point, she says, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. I'm sorry. She said, I'm doing what I did to the boys. I'm trying to get my inferior vena cava. Did you go for help? I went over to my wife and pleaded for her to tell me where the phones were. She asked me not to leave her. She did not leave the boys. So my question is, did you go for help, yes or no? The answer is no. 
after Megan dies, how long, what do you do? What do you do? Well, we skipped over quite a bit there. I don't know if you want to go through everything or not. What did you do after Megan died? What did I do? I yelled out the window to see if anybody was around to help. There was some weird sound coming from her mouth. I thought she was breathing. I started CPR after I wiped her mouth off with that gray pillow. Okay, so you, she's, she stabs herself once or twice? Like I said before, she stabbed herself a cumulative times of twice. Okay, and these are right after each other? That is no. Okay, so what happens? She stabbed herself the first time. I sat there pleading with her to allow me to find the phones, to allow me to leave her to go get help. My loyalty is to my wife. She did not want to be alone. I thought if I stood there, she said she was going through the inferior via cava. I have medical experience to know that one of those major arteries will bleed out quickly. In the area of the house, we liked the house rental because there was no one around. Neighbors weren't there. Most of the neighbors around us were snowbirds. If I left her, I thought she was going to die. I thought in my decision making, the best chance was for her to tell me where the phones were. At one point, I hate to say I annoyed her. I was trying to convince her, trying to talk into her language, saying obviously the universe doesn't want you to go. She says, I want to be with my kids. I need to be with my kids. So I leave. Objection non responsive. What do you do? All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think he's uncomfortable here with the idea of Megan dies. It's it's too hard. He's been softening this idea. And so um, he shifts to the other side of his chair. Great transition there over to the other side of the chair. Now, I think he then tries again to control the situation. He's got now a chop gesture down what I call the wheel plane coming down his center line with this chop. Very controlling. Uh, with You skipped over quite a bit. So again, tries to control the narrative, control the, the calendar, the timeline that's going on. Fails at that completely and then has to buy time with what did I do? So I think we're constantly seeing this person trying to control with their body, failing, then control with 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 trying to control the interview or the questioning and fail, really on his back foot here. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so I, I fully agree. And right when he says, I don't know if you want me to go through everything or not, there's a chin thrust, which is we do as a challenge. As primates, we present arteries to other primates to say, I'm not, I'm not threatened or scared by you. And he's basically saying, you know what? I've got all these details memorized. You want to test me on that? That's exactly what's happening here. I think there's question repetition when he says, what did I do? He's repeating the question exactly. And this guy is medically educated and this is not a behavior thing. So I'm deviating a little bit from my baseline. This guy's medically educated and he should know what that weird sound is coming from her mouth. This is called agonal respirations, and it does not come from the brain. It's the spinal cord trying to keep the body alive. And when he says, I thought she was breathing, I started CPR. If you think someone's breathing and then start CPR, you're an idiot. The details are about forensics defense and not the story at all. Every single detail that's given here is about defending a forensic finding. So he says, I have medical experience to know a major artery will bleed out quickly. That's hilarious. Uh, this, I mean, a, a person trained by the American Red Cross has more medical experience than this. But he's saying no one was around. He's saying no one was around our entire property. In the area of the house. We liked the house rental because there was no one around. Neighbors weren't there. Most of the neighbors around us were snowbirds. Is that why you yelled out the window for help? What did I do? I yelled out the window to see if anybody was around to help. I'm curious about that. Now, I love how he's having this weighted, deep, carefully thought out discussion, very calm, calculated discussion about life in general with his wife, Megan is her name, 
while she has a knife buried in her gut. And it seems like, you know, it's not a big deal. It's got a knife in here. We can have a casual conversation. I'm just, I've never said this on the behavior panel before. This is the biggest douchebag I've ever seen. And I am, I applaud the composure of the prosecuting attorney here. Greg, what do you, what do you got? Well, the level of arrogance that this guy comes up with through this entire thing, but I'll point out the body language of arrogance as we get closer to the end of this. I have written right on my notes, this is a skit. This is a skit. Who talks to somebody? Uh, uh, Megan, how does it feel while you're in there digging around? Did you get the right artery? Is about what this sounds like. I mean, yeah. Okay, number one, he, he stops her and says, hold on, let me tell my story in effect. Would you want to hear what happened in between? That tells you this is incremental storytelling. He's setting it up so he has a way to get exactly what he wants out. My quick, quick question is, number one, why did you wipe her mouth? But number two, why with a pillow? I think something is up with a pillow that would break his story apart. And so he's trying to say, I wiped her mouth with the pillow. Mm -hmm. That's an added detail that we don't need. And she misses asking that question. That's a lead. Then he does something that we always say is a great indicator. Scott, you said it earlier. This is lying 101. Like I said before. Like I said before, she stabbed herself a cumulative times or twice. Redirect. Back to something I said before. Then he says, in a detailed cumulative of two. This is all her stuff. No, she stabbed herself twice, and I was panicked, and I tried to do this. But instead, what does he do? He says, well, I was talking to her. I was afraid she would die if I left. Well, she's certainly going to die if you don't leave. This whole logic thing from a medical point of view, from a guy who knows... But he's a, he's a physical therapist. Guarantee he knows where arteries and that are under the skin, under the muscle. He knows where muscles are put together. This guy has probably has to have a doctorate to practice in today's world. So this guy knows more than he's letting on. And then just why, this the basic question. Why didn't you stop her from stabbing herself? The basic question, instead of running for help, why didn't you stop her from, okay, she's already stabbed once and she's still looking for an artery. Stop. Go over there, take the knife out of her hand. This reminds me of being in the Army. Navy probably does it too. The first thing you do is you go, Annie, Annie, are you all right? Help. They have a little anatomical Annie dummy that you check for pulse, you check for breathing before you start and chase you, hit it dead on. I'm giving somebody CPR who's breathing. I'm not yelling for help. I might stick my head out. This is all messed up. Then when he gets to this point where he says, in my decision making, he gets that swivel rate thing going that we always Full talk swivel. about. Yep, full Doesn't swivel. Fall. He's getting away from it. <laughs> Any, I, I just have to think, how does anybody else, does anybody else wonder what kind of conversation you have with a person who's got a knife in their gut, stabbing around? I, you're clearly stronger than she is. She's lying on the floor. You could take the knife from her. There's real arrogance at the objection. When the guy says objection, his attorney, chin thrust, throat is open. That's defiance. We all say that to you all the time. Looks down his nose. And there's slight amusement as the corner of his mouth rise. This guy, yeah, he thinks he's brilliant. If he only knew how, what we see, he might have a different opinion. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. And at the top of that, he tries to, once again to take control of the conversation. He's got more of his story that he didn't get to tell that he needs to add in there. So it lines up with exactly what happened. Because if you listen to what he says, you can go straight from when he first gets there all the way up to where she's stabbing herself. And everything fits right in from what he's looking at. You can go through and look at all those things as you went. So he didn't get to say those parts. So that's why he's adding that stuff in. And when he says, I looked out the window to see if anybody could help. Like, again, I said this earlier, he would have hollered. He just, if that was going to happen, he wouldn't have done that anyway. He would have run out of the house because he would be, a, he would, number one, he wouldn't be there because he'd be afraid she's going to kill him. Number two, if she's laying there trying to stab herself, trying to hurry car yourself or Harry Carey, have you say it correctly? That's, that hurts, man. That hurts. When I'm running through the house to, to catch the dog, you know, catch Chatty or something, I hit my knee, everything shuts down, man, right then. <laughs> it's done. We're, we're done until I get finished going, like, uh, like on Family Guy. I'm done, man. So if somebody's trying to stab themselves, and another, another thing that when you see a, a, a suicide, uh, somebody's committed suicide, and, and the person with them says they tried to stab me, you know, before they killed themselves, well, then what's happened is that person who has supposedly been, almost been stabbed has been has killed that person. This is the road they go down because they'll have these little things where they try to to stab Hesitation. themselves, try to Hesitation. cut themselves. Yeah, and these little mark on you where you, you got to try it again and keep going because it hurts. 
and nobody's going to have any kind of conversation. The only word that that woman would be saying is, ah, that's all you would hear. And the neighbors would have heard it too, no matter how far away they were, because that hurts when you do that. So gosh, I'm getting all worked up in this. Anyway, he should be all worn out talking about that as well. And where he is in the situation, in, in this, uh, on the stand, not only, and the, and the attorney, she's really not good at, at, at asking questions. She's really not good at getting them, getting the information she needs out. I know we're coming off that Johnny Depp Amber Heard where we saw a pro that everybody fell in love with, but this is, this is not good. She's not, she sees all, there's all, all like you're saying, Greg, all these openings where you can climb in and go, hang on a minute, man. What'd you just say? What are you talking about? Why didn't she say? So she's talking to you while she's stabbing herself. Is that what, is that what you're and hearing even, this? Even if it's not productive or it's objected to, the jury heard it. You've jabbed it into the jury's mind. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, look, exactly. Any, anybody sitting, any, any sane person there has to be, are you really telling me you're having a conversation while somebody's slicing her abdominal aorta? Monty Python. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Monty Python, man. Exactly yeah. like that. So, all right, I'm done. You guys good? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. All right. After Megan dies, how long, what do you do? What do you do? Well, we skipped over quite a bit there. I don't know if you want to go through everything or not. What did you do after Megan died? What did I do? Mm-hmm. I yelled out the window to see if anybody was around to help. There was some weird sound coming from her mouth. I thought she was breathing. I started a CPR after I wiped her mouth off with that gray pillow. Okay, so you... She's, she stabs herself once or twice? Like I said, before, she stabbed herself a cumulative times of twice. Okay. And these are right after each other? That is no. Okay, so what happens? She stabbed herself the first time. I sat there pleading with her to allow me to find the phones, to allow me to leave her to go get help. My loyalty is to my wife. She did not want to be alone. I thought if I stood there, she said she was going through the inferior via cava. I have medical experience to know that one of those major arteries will bleed out quickly. In the area of the house, we liked the house rental because there was no one around. Neighbors weren't there. Most of the neighbors around us were snowbirds. If I left her, I thought she was going to die. I thought in my decision making, the best chance was for her to tell me where the phones were. At one point, I hate to say I annoyed her. I was trying to convince her, trying to talk into her language, saying obviously the universe doesn't want you to go. She says, I want to be with my kids. I need to be with my kids. So I leave. Objection non responsive. What do you do? Did you go to Sarasota? No. There was no way I could drive to Sarasota. Did you leave your phone at a Starbucks in Sarasota? If I didn't go to Sarasota, I didn't leave my phone. So you're denying that you went to Starbucks in Sarasota? In Sarasota, that's correct. And you, you, so you never went to the beach in Sarasota? Nope. It was over two hours away. There was no way I could drive. And you did see the interview that was played yesterday, right? Correct. I did see the interview. And... You did speak with the detective more than one time, right? That's what they tell me. You're denying this knowledge? Ma'am, I don't even remember talking to the interview that day. So, you don't remember talking to the detective on January 15th of 2020? Last thing I remember was falling down the stairs and saying, you hold on to somebody in custody, deputy. Next thing I knew, I woke up in jail and thought I was in purgatory with the red floor and the bright sky. Okay. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so in the beginning, when she starts questioning him, he's touching his face. Well, we assume that's an adapter, a way to comfort self. And so people release nervous energy. That's a way of, of, of comforting self. He swivels at the question of leaving his phone in Sarasota. And he has some, again, smart-ass m- remark. If I had never been in Sarasota, I couldn't have left my phone there. He's a, this is allowing the guy to condition the question. Because technically, if I'm in the outskirts of a town, if I'm in a non-branded Stop. Let's say I'm in the uh, in the Starbucks, and it's in a suburb that is not called 
Sarasota? It's not Sarasota. And this is the kind of guy who would parse those facts. So in this case, he goes out and he says, exactly, I've never been to a to a Starbucks in Sarasota. She should say, when was the last time you were in Starbucks, period, and then play from there. But she doesn't. She does a bad leading questions by saying, you didn't go to the Starbucks in Sarasota. Yeah. Okay, well, there you go. Then he does this piercing stare with Romancer. We always say he does the Aaron Cathy blink rate. His eyes are cemented open. I don't know how he's holding them open that well. Look at his hands. He's a nail biter, so he's got nervous energy. You know, I always look for fingernails when people have chewed their yeah. nails away. It's an indicator that their nervous energy has to go somewhere, so you pay attention to that. She's feeding him with leading and poor questions, and he's getting away with it. And his iterative storytelling is getting good because she is not good with questions. That will fall apart when she starts to lock him down with a transcript and ask, did you say this? Did you say that? Did you?" So it's going to work for in the long term, but it isn't working well here. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. So this so far, this is the most uncomfortable we've seen him. And these are the biggest indicators that let us know he's uncomfortable. When... Um, when when he puts starts putting his hand on his face, that's one thing. He's adapting at that point. Then it becomes what's called Joe Navarro refers to as facial denting. When he does that whole thing, when he starts pushing his face and everything starts smushing in, and you can feel that when it happens. I mean, go ahead and push on your face and get that feeling. You'll see what I'm talking about. Because when you let go, it kind of relaxes those muscles in there. But sometimes something so intense, you need to be pushing because you're feeling that finger stretch or your finger stretch. You're feeling all those things. And not it just doesn't help take your mind off of it, but it kind of relaxes you as you're stretching muscles and pushing, and it gives you something, almost something to do to remove yourself from what's happening at that at that point. Um, so the deeper the dent, the more the more stress there is, especially in this case. And he gives answers like you're saying, Greg, like he's solving a logic problem for a fourth grader. I didn't have a phone, so I couldn't say. No kidding. No, there's no need to do that. But I think what he's doing with these is he's buying time to think. At this point, he makes sure he gets all of his details in, but he pushes back. But it doesn't take much time to get something going in there. So if you're trying to work something out really quickly and with your story, make sure you're going forward. And I think he's doing that because he's looking for time to think, or trying to create time to think. We see that like you're like you're saying, he's got that little swing going back in his chair, going back and forth in his chair. He's locked down and he's turtling. He's got all that going on. His eye is his blink rate isn't very much because he's locked on making sure he doesn't miss anything. His brain goes, we better watch watch her and find out what she's saying and pay attention so we don't miss something at this point. He answers really quickly, these short, sharp, sharp shock uh, shots of answers. And um, he, he looks locked down. He really looks like locked, locked down. If this watching this, if this makes you feel weird. And because you think it sounds weird and you think it looks weird, it is weird. It is weird. This is this is this is totally out of character for for normal human behavior. That's why we're saying earlier, this is a great example of uh, for lessons to watch when someone's being deceptive. And remember, if it looks like a duck and it sounds like a duck, it probably killed its family. <laughs> Mark, what do you got? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I agree with you. Not about the duck thing. I mean, it could, it might not be a duck. Who knows? <laughs> you know. Uh, but I certainly agree with you uh, on on that self stimulation piece where he's he's kind of pushing in hard enough that he he may be causing enough pain, you know, in order to control that. So, if the outside environment is painful to a human being, they'll often con they they can control that by causing their own pain in some way. That, that that's probably happening at the moment. But even if it's not, that is a full face block that he's got now. And I think sometimes you'll see him talk as well and you'll see the little finger just poke up in front of the lips as well to block those just slightly as well. And that is such a difference from where we've seen him before. Okay? So I think it's it's there's such a cluster there of he's in trouble right now. Just one other interesting kind of cultural thing I want to note there is he has a really good understanding, a fuller idea of the geography of 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 um, the mythology of death in Christianity. So the idea of purgatory and and Greg, you brought up the first the the third circle of hell as well. And and so so it's quite interesting. We've got somebody here who wants to mention that that finer point of the geography of the mythology in, in the Christian 
passing from life into an eternal life and that purgatory is a stop off. Most people don't really know that. Most people go, oh, you know, you die and you like you go to heaven, don't you? No, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that happens in between, which, you know, is kind of interesting for me that he understands that detailed story. And my guess would be is that has something to do with why this has gone on. I mean, why else would he mention that kind of detail in this particular situation? Chase, what do you got on this one? I agree with you guys. And uh, y'all covered most of it. Uh, I've got one left. His failing memory uh, because of all this police trauma that he endured. So if you don't know, he's claiming to have memory loss for all of this time period after you know the, the cops came and got him. All this failing failing memory just disappears the moment that he's able to relay how someone else could have done it except for him. That's extremely convenient. Huge red flag. I think this is due to the fact that he fully confessed to committing all of these crimes. And the only pathway to getting his confession off the record was the classic three-part three part dance. The drugs in my system, memory loss, and I couldn't make legal or logical decisions for myself at that point in time. Did you go to Sarasota? No. There was no way I could drive to Sarasota. Did you leave your phone at a Starbucks in Sarasota? If I didn't go to Sarasota, I didn't leave my phone. So you're denying that you went to Starbucks in Sarasota? In Sarasota, that's correct. And you, so you never went to the beach in Sarasota? Nope. It was over two hours away. There was no way I could drive. And you did see the interview that was played yesterday, right? Correct. I did see the interview. And... You did speak with the detective more than one time, right? That's what they tell me. You're denying this knowledge? Ma'am, I don't even remember talking to the interview that day. So, you don't remember talking to the detective on January 15th of 2020? Last thing I remember was falling down the stairs and saying, you hold on to somebody in custody, deputy. Next thing I knew, I woke up in jail and thought I was in purgatory with the red floor and the bright sky. Okay. And... Is it true that the multiple times that you spoke to detectives, that you told detectives that you went into Zoe's room, you gathered the courage, and you rolled over on top of your daughter until she suffocated? Isn't you know, that what you told law enforcement? Is this a yes or no question, or do you want the yes answer? Yes or no question. That is what the video, yes, showed you. And your testimony here today is that Megan did it. Megan killed Zoe. And you told the detectives multiple times that after Zoe, you went to Alec's room. And Alec is your oldest, was your oldest son, correct? That's correct. And Alec was 13 years old and he was the strongest, right? That is incorrect, ma'am. Who is the strongest? Tyler is downstairs. Okay, so you go to Alex's room next because Alex's upstairs. That's correct. Right? And you told law enforcement on multiple occasions that you went into Alex's room and you stabbed Alec and you suffocated Alec. Isn't that correct? That's partially correct. And isn't it true that you initially told law enforcement multiple times that Megan was in there during that killing. That's what the video showed, yes. And isn't it true that you also told law enforcement that Megan took part in the killing? That's what the video showed, that's correct. And that in fact, Megan held Alex's legs down while you suffocated Alex. That's what the video showed, that's correct. And your testimony today is that that is not true. My testimony today is the fact that Megan killed her kids and killed herself. Okay. All right, I'll go first on this one. Uh, we see another huge adapter, and uh, that's where he's pushing his finger into his neck. Same kind of thing we saw last time, except it's getting worse. Because when you, there's a different feeling when you're pushing there than when you're pushing on your neck in there. You've got that little lymph node you're going by and pushing on, and you're stretching your finger. That's helping a lot, helping him a lot too. But pushing in there and staying, that's weird because you feel it up in your mouth at that point. He's almost looks like he's going up into his sinus area with it, but it's still. That's an adapter that helps him get rid of that built-up stress or tension. So the stress is building. Uh, 
And this is sort of where the news starts to tighten on him. And even though this is questioning that the attorney's doing isn't really good, she's getting what she needs out of him or what she wants out of him. Um, the shoulder shrugs really aren't, I, I wouldn't count those as shoulder shrugs as far as deception goes. He just can't get comfortable. So that's why he feels really quick things. He's trying to move around. It's almost like a tick at that point. And he's trying to keep himself calm while this is happening. I think that's what that's about. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is actually one of my favorites because he feels he has upper hand in the beginning. You can see he's doing that kind of chin up and he's judgmental. But she's starting to make a mess of his iterative storytelling now because she's asking yes or no. And that yes or no has been effective for him to get some things out in the past. But now she's going to shift to talking about the transcript. And when I'm making you stick to a transcript, now you're admitting to something or, or fighting it and saying, no, I didn't do it. That starts to make your story come apart. Now, whether that was her plan or not, no idea, but it starts to become effective. And if you don't believe that's true, listen to when he says, is this a yes or no question? Is this a yes or no question? Or do you want the yes answer? or no question. That is what the video yes shows you. That's what he's looking for is how do I get to deliver my story if you do that? And then he says, is it a question or do you want me to do this? That storytelling starts to come apart. She could shift gears right here and start to push on him, but she doesn't. I'm just I'm going to skip a couple of things. But every opportunity this guy gets to release info, he does. There's one interesting little fleeting piece of body language to go and watch very carefully. After he says that's correct about going to his son's room because it's upstairs, you see a really quick you could call it a micro expression, fleeting terror go across his head right here. Something is up in his story that he needs to stay away from. And I don't know what it is. And I would have gone, hold on, hold, hold on. I would go and figure out what's going on there. Even though, e even part of that's going to be partially correct, but he starts to mouth groom a little bit and do something a little odd. And we can't tell why, but we're seeing signs of fight or flight. My guess is it's to that fleeting terror that he had. And then she locks him down further in this transcript, and he says, my testimony today is the fact that, that's all filler, that's all, Megan killed her kids, her kids, and then herself. He eye blocks, he mouth grooms, and he swivels. That right there is plenty. Guys, if we haven't seen enough, that sentence, that distancing that much, that distancing from your kids and that swiveling and showing fight or flight, somebody needs to be crawling all over this guy. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think he's trying to cope here with the significant reversal of the story that's now that he's now gone for. Uh, I think he looks down in order to... He's thinking of self-soothing with some kind of bottle of water, I imagine. Um, but and Which would make a great... I mean, it's a great thing to bring in as a block. Great thing to do to protect yourself. For some reason, he decides not to. I don't know why he decides not to, but if I think he makes it, it's, you know, maybe there's no bottle there. Maybe it's got no water in it. And he goes, I'm going to look like an idiot because there's nothing to drink. Um, or maybe he just decides against it because maybe... Maybe he goes, no, I'll just look like I'm self-soothing. That won't look good. But then, because he can't use that, he has to readjust. And that's what I think the shoulder stuff is there. He's now got to do something to readjust to the fact that he's that he the story's going a different way now. He wanted to go for the water, but he's decided not to. And now he's got to do something in order to make it look like you should be doing that kind of thing. It's a complete mess for him right now, uh, as it should be. Chase, what do you got on this one? I think our first five episodes that we ever filmed, uh, I had, I was drinking out of a cup and I realized it was empty. And then I pretended to drink out of it because I wanted to commit. I, want, <laughs> yes. I, I don't quit. I, I commit to things. So what I think he was doing here is a, a medical technique for people who are suffering certain kinds of emergencies. You can rub up and down right here. It's called a carotid massage. That's the actual name of it. Go look it up. Really cool. But it's proven to lower blood pressure, calm people down. You can actually do that just by poking in here and kind of rubbing it around. I think that's what he's doing. He's a physical therapist. He's on the stand. He's freaking out. I think that he's defaulting to this technique. And I think he's doing out of all this crap that he's doing, he's doing this one thing, I think, on purpose. Because I think he feels more self-assured because there's this deniant, defiant, like this self-amused uh, behavior at his little defense strategy, which actually reminds me of Amber Heard. Uh, 
Amber Heard's not doubling down because it's true. She's doubling down because it's based on her belief in her ability and how unintelligent that person thinks the everyone else is. And I think this little worm uh, believes the same. And when he says Megan killed her kids, that's a big deal. Then we can call it a slip. You can call it a mistake if you want to. It's a big deal to probably all four of us. And then herself. And right when he says herself, I want you to watch his lower jaw. And we do this during concealed anger, especially if we're hiding anger. But I think this one is a concealed tongue jut. And I think he's just preventing himself from parting his lips. And I think that's what we're seeing here. It wasn't high def enough for me to see. That's all I got for this one. And is it true that the multiple times that you spoke to detectives, that you told detectives that you went into Zoe's room, you gathered the courage, and you rolled over on top of your daughter until she suffocated. Isn't you know, that what you told law enforcement? Is this a yes or no question, or do you want the yes answer? Yes or no question. That is what the video, yes, showed you. And your testimony here today is that Megan did it. Megan killed Zoe. And you told the detectives multiple times that after Zoe, you went to Alec's room. And Alec is your oldest, was your oldest son, correct? That's correct. And Alec was 13 years old, and he was the strongest, right? That is incorrect, ma'am. Who is the strongest? Tyler is downstairs. Okay, so you go to Alec's room next because Alec's upstairs. That's correct. Right? And you told law enforcement on multiple occasions that you went into Alec's room and you stabbed Alec and you suffocated Alec. Isn't that correct? That's partially correct. And isn't it true that you initially told law enforcement multiple times that Megan was in there during that killing. That's what the video showed, yes. And isn't it true that you also told law enforcement that Megan took part in the killing? That's what the video showed, that's correct. And that in fact, Megan held Alex's legs down while you suffocated Alex. That's what the video showed. That's correct. And your testimony today is that that is not true. My testimony today is the fact that Megan killed her kids and killed herself. Okay. All right. Well, let's throw it around the room and talk about what we think we saw during this in 30 seconds or less. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, you know, look, obviously we've got a complete liar there. I think that's pretty obvious to people. But look back at some of the classics of body language. I especially like to see in that that halt and suppress gesture there. And it tells me something about his general demeanor, which I think, you know, we've been right all along. There is something about him suppressing what's going on, that that emotion inside him. And, and you know, chances are it's turned out very, very badly for his family, which is massively unfortunate. Chase, what do you think? I'll rewrap exactly as I did. I think this person is having a long standing issue with control versus being controlling, dominant versus domineering, self control versus self restraint. You can see it in the hand gesture Mark just talked about. I think that if the hand is like this, the further down the hand is, the more respect or reverence that person is showing. The further up it is, the less respect or reverence. Because you see somebody with social anxiety, their hand will just stretch out flat on the table while their hand's down there, while they're objecting to something. But again, he is the exact individual that cannot really fully comprehend the difference between experiencing pleasure and feeling happiness. He equates the two with the same, and you can tell that by the neighborhood that he moved into. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, if I were picking a video to show you some rudimentary body language and deception, things that we associate with deception through clusters, this would be it. This guy comes in with iterative storytelling. He doesn't have a lot of fight or flight. He's pretty contained in the beginning because he's 
certain of his ability. Now, whether his ability is good or not, it's another story. He rambles at times. He conditions questions. He takes holy high ground, whatever you want to call it. He stammers and stutters. His cadence changes at hard facts. He has conversations with people in the middle of the most emotional things on earth without any emotion. And when he's trying to convince the jury of how horrible this was, he almost melts down as long as he's on direct and there's no threat. This, to me, is a beacon of deception. We know he lies because he set, had three different stories. So one of those is a lie. I'm guessing this is it. That's my my vote. Scott, what do you got? All right, I agree. I think, like I said earlier, this is a great study for the person just getting into body language and deception. If you want to know what the basics are, you just saw them. So go back over this a couple of times because the things we're pointing out are just the first things when you go in and so like one of us goes, okay, here's what you're looking for. Here's the section on deception. Let's start here. And we've just gone straight down the line doing that. So this is like a, a 101 for the basics of deception and body language. All right, fellas, thinks this is a good one. We'll see you next time. See you. The behavior panel. I had to signal you because it was just too good. Oh, oh man. <laughs> good one. Wow. Good wow. one. I want good you to know I would lean way harder into you guys than you just did on me. Right now, I would <laughs> I'd go another two minutes on that. <laughs> wow, that's too bad. Okay, <laughs> sorry. All right, let's give another shot. Here we go. Yeah. I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know.